Good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. I am Kim Lee, Director of Community Engagement here at the American Council on Education. And I am excited to be the host and moderator for today's event. Before we get started, I would just want to call your attention to a few housekeeping items. Most importantly, we want you to join the conversation. And so we'll be taking questions throughout this webinar. If you want to join the conversation and you have a question, please post it in the chat and we will take as many of them as possible during this time frame. Also, if you're interested in learning more about ACE's work with the Association of College and University Educators, I invite you to visit the ACE website and the website for the Association of College and University Educators. And both of those websites will be posted in the chat shortly. It is my pleasure on behalf of the American Council on Education to collaborate with AQ and to moderate a panel of consummate leaders who will engage in dialogue around the importance and the relationship between faculty development and student retention. You know, the collective accomplishments of learners who have or are matriculating on college and university campuses are too numerable to identify. The immeasurable successes to higher education's credit are not without opportunities to consider. Though many learners choose higher education, some do not remain through completion. College and university educators and leaders across this country continue to engage in dialogue and set strategic priorities around improving student engagement and student retention. But how does faculty development inform? transform, support, advocate, or ad provide advocacy, or reify successful student retention strategies. For the next 45 minutes or so, this stellar panel will explore the relationship between faculty development and student retention. Each of us can think of numerable anecdotal stories from students who identify at least one faculty member who was or is instrumental in their academic progress, and perhaps maybe in their successful completion of a program of study. As higher education practitioners, we know the inextricable link between faculty presentation of content and student engagement. Now, I would like to introduce and welcome our guest for this conversation. Dr. Derek Anderson, Senior Vice President here at the American Council on Education. Dr. Penny McCormack, Chief Academic Officer at the Association of College and University Educators. Dr. Michael Pullen, Dean for Academic Initiatives at Queensboro Community College. And Dr. Lori Worth, who serves as Provost at the University of Pikesville, who is our representative from the Association of Chief Academic Officers. To get us started, as you provide a brief introduction, I would like for each of you to tell us a little bit about your perspective on the relationship between faculty development and student retention. Be sure to share your thoughts on why we need to elevate this conversation now. Dr. Anderson, your thoughts. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. Uh, grateful to, uh, to be on this on this panel with these uh, excellent perspectives, excellent guests. It's it's a great honor to be here. And thank you, Kim, for moderating this conversation. Uh, so, in addition to being here in Washington at the American Council on Education, where I get to see sort of a systems level perspective on some of the problems that are facing higher education, like retention. Um, I'm also a professor who teaches. I still teach, uh, and uh, and I remember early in my career as a professor at a so I'm a professor at Arizona State University, a research one institution, uh, where I had an opportunity to speak with my provost, who um, provided me some guidance, uh, you know, and it was really oriented around research excellence and productivity in my in my you know as a researcher, um, and you know teaching excellence as well. 
But on this issue of retention, he said, you know, Derek, we're a big university. We have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of really excellent professionals here. And we have people who kind of focus on retention. So we need you to focus on content and, and excellence in this teaching and, and research space. Um, and then as I got and, and I still, you know, I love my my former provost and, and great, you know, he's been a great mentor to me for a long time. But I think as I've as I've grown over the years, I've realized that I think retention is a multidimensional problem. Uh, it's a, a and a multidimensional opportunity. Um, and there's not just, you know, one part of the university uh, that focuses on retention. There's many parts of the university that focus on retention. Uh, and I, as a faculty member, have a role to play. So I'm great, grateful to be here and to talk about my role as a faculty member. Thank you, Kip. Back over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Derek. Dr. McCormick. Thanks, Kip. Um, and I too am excited to be here today um, with this, um, this lovely panel. My name is Penny McCormick and I am the Chief Academic Officer for the Association of College and University Educators, AQ for short. Um, now, our mission is to improve student success and equity through quality instruction. And, you know, I've been working in this field, um, field of education for over 25 years. And um, I am honored to have had numerous opportunities, you know, to work with instructors, whether it be K-12 or higher le le level, um, higher ed level instructors to improve teaching that would result in improved learning. I mean, there is solid research proven connection there. So when I think about the significant need our country has for a more educated workforce, for a more educated citizenry, and I read article after article questioning the value of a college degree, I am convinced that the time is now to make the necessary changes to effectively educate the larger and more diverse student body coming to us seeking a better life for themselves and often for their families. So I believe failure to act now to ensure those students seeking a better life, a better educational experience with us, honestly, I know this is gonna sound bold, but puts at risk the future of higher education itself. Thanks, Kim. Thank you, Penny. Thank you so very much for sharing. Dr. Pullen, your thoughts. Yes. Hello, thank you for having me today. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, yes, my name is Michael Pullen. I'm the Dean for Academic Initiatives at Queensborough Community College in uh, Queens, New York City. We're part of the City University of New York system, one of 25 campuses. Um, I started my academic career as a chemistry professor at New Mexico Tech. Uh, and in addition to doing re you know, regular scientific research, I also did a lot of work on um, using undergraduate research experiences to improve STEM student diversity and retention. And uh, really became interested in the education uh, side of my job in a, in a much deeper way as a result of that. And uh, so I continued that work and I, I have continued it throughout my career, but I've also become very interested in faculty professional development, especially around active, active learning and uh, you know, research proven teaching practices. So when I moved to Broward College in, in 2014, um, we um, uh, started a faculty development program there, which eventually led to the adoption of AQ. And in, in 2018, I moved to Queensboro, uh, where we're, we're continuing to work with AQ as, as a way to provide faculty with professional development. I think. You know, this, this really is a national problem. I, you know, the vast majority of our uh, faculty, even though we're at, I'm at a community college, have graduated from R1 universities where they focused mainly on research. And, um, you know, they've chosen the, the career where they're where teaching is a much larger part of their, their portfolio than research, although we have, you know, plenty of researchers here as well. But, um, you know, they're no, they're no better equipped uh, from, from their graduate education to, to teach. So you know, the vast majority of them have never taken a single teaching class or education course. So, um, you know, it's, it's, I think a little bit of a failing of our, of our, our doctoral education system in the US. Um, but, you know, of course there are ways to, to bring that professional development to those faculty. And I, I see more and more of them entering our schools as new professors 
really wanting that experience and wanting to uh, do an excellent job at teaching and feeling like they, they have a lot to learn. So uh, that's what's brought me to AQ and I guess to this, uh, to this panel. Thank you so very much, Dr. Pullen. Dr. Worth, your thoughts, please. Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to see where some of you are from, not only the continental United States, but some of our international partners. So I wanted to welcome all of you. My name is Lori Worth, and I am the Provost and Chief Academic Officer at University of Pikeville. We're located in Pikeville, Kentucky, the easternmost county here. Um, and I'm also a member and a board member uh, for the Association of Chief Academic Officers, our organization uh, really designed to support academic leaders and chief academic officers across all sectors of higher education. And a big part of our strategic plan is professional development as well. I think I'm coming from several different lenses today, um, one of which is a faculty member myself working in two different colleges throughout my career. I worked in a school of nursing and a school of education. Um, my work in uh, academia at our institution were rural and remote, uh, tucked away in the mountains of Appalachia, two hours from any major interstate, two and a half hours from an airport. And so that rural, remote, first generation perspective and what it means to service our students. But also we have three health professional programs, an osteopathic medical school, optometry school, and now dental school and what it means to service faculty members who we recruit who have been clinicians and practitioners but might be newer in the role of teaching. And so I'm very excited about this webinar. Faculty um, are with our students and the connection is so close. Um, our students spend the most time on college campuses across the world with faculty members. And so being able to understand what engagement looks like inside, outside of the classroom, program development, the discussion of wellness. Um, I really believe that a responsive and connected, caring community makes our students feel welcomed. Um, it, it fosters student success and overall retention success at our institutions. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Lori, Michael, Penny, and Derek for giving us those introductions. I want to take this moment and just reiterate ACUE, AQ is the Association of College and University Educators, and Dr. Worth that you just finished hearing from, she's representing ACAO, that's the um, Association of Chief Academic Officers. And we'll try to keep putting that in the chat because I see a few of the questions. So based on, thank you for those opening comments too. And earlier in my comments, I said, we could think of some anecdotal stories, right? We have some qualitative data about students that we know that identified a faculty member. And I'd like to start this with Michael and Lori, since you are um, at relative, you're at institutions. Share with us some of the salient data points observed quantitatively in your work that further substantiates how faculty development informs student engagement or student retention. And Michael, if you'd begin. Sure, sure. When I when I arrived at, at Broward College, uh, you know, I continued to work on, on exposing community college students to research outside the classroom, but I also wanted something that would affect what's happening inside the classroom since that's where students spend the majority of their time. And we knew that there were low pass rates for key science and math courses, as well as equity gaps in those courses. And so we wanted to solve both of those problems. And research, you know, just a, a small amount of research immediately pointed me towards, you know, changing the mode of instruction. There, there are hundreds and hundreds of now published research articles to indicate that that, that approach um, can uh, both increase overall student success as well as close equity gaps. So I wrote an NSF grant and uh, partnered with the Carl Wyman Science Education Initiative at the University of British Columbia. And we developed our own uh, faculty development workshop for the, over the summer and brought in a, a cohort of science faculty. They uh, learned all about active learning, got to practice it on each other and uh, 
revised courses and we followed what happened in those courses over the, the following fall and spring terms. And, you know, we found that the faculty, you know, adopted those practices and that uh, that resulted in um, much higher SEER better rates in the courses and uh, mostly closed uh, equity gaps for Black and Hispanic students in those courses as well. And so uh, we were real pleased with that. And then, um, you know, at the same time, Broward uh, became doing that on a, became interested in doing that on a much wider basis uh, with for all kinds of faculty. And so at that point, we moved on to adopting the effective teaching practices course at at Broward. And you know, if you go to the AQ website, Broward, uh, the the impact on Broward College has been well documented there, and um, it helped close course completion gaps for Black students and a gap in passing courses. Um, a gap in passing courses was closed for Pell eligible students when uh, students took courses taught by AQ credentialed faculty. So again, the you know the same result on a much larger scale than I, I did with my NSF grant. So we're we're working on the, a similar project here at Queensboro, and we just started our uh, our big evaluation year. So uh, hopefully by um, the end of the summer we'll have. Um, uh, you know, some, some, you know, similar numerical results. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Lori? Thanks, Michael, for your points as well. I think um, if, if your institution doesn't have an effective teaching course, you mentioned a little bit about that, Michael, and I, our institution has something very similar. I think that's very important and a really good strategic initiative some of what we've done with it is a new faculty mentoring program where faculty are part of a mentoring program and it's, it's it's just great development and professional development so i appreciate that the first thing i'll say is just a plug in general for associations depending on what your institution is interested in um, please depending on what you want to be involved in i really am an advocate for associations the professional development that associations provide complement what we invest in as an institution. So I've, I've I've been to several association webinars, in-person conferences, and we very much value the partnership of associations. Mine happens to be ACAO, but a variety around the country that just being involved, I think is very important at an institutional level and in leadership. Um, there are very basic metrics, quantitative, and of course, evaluations is something we've talked about uh, the last few weeks since fall semester, preparing for spring semester courses in ways faculty can pivot in the classroom. There are data points um, on class structure, faculty interactions. Right now, we're even talking about what type of survey that we distribute to students, how we can increase response rate, the questions we ask the scale that it measures on. And so it is time for our institution to relook and evaluate those questions, making sure they have inclusive language, making sure they really hit the disciplines that, that we have at our institution. We have a strong liberal arts college and program in addition to courses um, within the sciences and prepare students for medical school. So I think that's important. Faculty and departments, um, they may conduct focus groups surveys to be able to assess new program development, programs that are currently offered. And I think that's very important as well, whether it's time to launch a new academic program, you're assessing a current one, what our students have to say, and you don't have to wait for an end of course evaluation with metrics. We can distribute those throughout the academic year at any point in the semester. And so I think that's an important tool working with our student government association. When we launched a new learning management system, we went to our SGA officers and asked them for help to distribute a survey to students. And that was very important for us. Again, metrics and data doesn't have to align to the end of a semester. You can really do it at any point. Faculty who might be new at an institution and might be struggling, um, teaching, learning, they're brand new to higher education, there may be ways for us to be able to support them, their metrics, not only DFWI um, course evaluations, but, but ways that we can really take our faculty and make sure that there's a support system 
personalized and specialized professional development, which I think overall benefits student success. Thank you, thank you both. So from, we've heard from a campus perspective, Penny and Derek, if you would share with us, what do you know works um, when increasing faculty development to improve student engagement retention from an association's perspective and a council's perspective? If you would speak to that. Of course, I'm on mute. Uh, that's a tradition here at ACE. Um, I was actually gonna see if Penny wanted to go first um, and uh, just given her, so one thing I love about working with AQ is that they're so data-driven. It's like they're, um, you know, they're, they're obsessed with data. And so I thought maybe AQ, if you could maybe maybe lead the conversation, I can follow up from the ACE perspective. What do you think? Happy to do that, Derek, yeah. and thanks for the opportunity. Um, I want to just start by um, recognizing your reminder that our students and most of us, right, can remember that teacher that changed our lives and how important that relationship was and likely still is. So I just wanna mention that um, before I jump into our data, which um, we are a bit obsessed with at AQ. But because our mission, like if you think of our mission, right, is to help institutions meet their student success and equity goals through quality instruction, that mission requires um, that we create and deliver really good quality faculty development, but that it also, um, results in improved student outcomes. So with that in mind, we started measuring, as, as Michael noted too, um, the efficacy of our faculty development right away. And we now have 18 research studies and counting that show our offerings result in improved student grades, improved course completion rates, decreased DFWs, narrowed and closed equity gaps, as well as improved retention rates. Those studies are all on our website in both like a brief and a full report format. So anyone who wants to take a deep dive into our methodologies, our processes, we invite you to do so. But in a nutshell, we have solid data that shows engaging faculty to learn about evidence-based teaching practices, significantly improve student engagement, um, other student outcomes, as well as institutional retention rates. And we're proud, we're, we're very proud of that data. I'll just chime in. So I, we love working with AQ. ACE has a, a long history, a long partnership with AQ. And part of the reason why we love working with AQ is because they're so data driven and they, you know, they provide for, you know, for you as a single institution, a reference point, you know, internally relative to where you have been and where you can go and, 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 and where you've been. But then they also bring to bear in their partnership with you as a university all of their experience and all of their data from across, you know, the hundreds of universities that they work with. So we love, you know, we love that kind of partnership and we're happy to promote and to accelerate that kind of a partnership. Um, I'll also add that, you know, from a systems perspective, one of the challenges that we see here is um, obviously the pervasiveness of, of, the re of the retention problem, you know, so for a long time, we've been in, in higher education talking about access. And we've realized that, um, you know, access isn't necessarily the problem anymore. It's, it's you know it's 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 what's what's what happens once you get there. I was at a I was at a um, um I was at an event yesterday, uh, and a former college president told this uh, told a story about uh, a student who she saw crying on campus, uh, and and she was provost at that point in time, and she had walked out to go. Um, uh, and there's a special place in heaven for provosts, as we as 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 uh, uh, you know as as yeah, I'm sure everyone at ACA knows ACAO knows. But uh, so she she sees a student crying on campus and she walks out and and the student had had encountered a uh, financial aid problem that was you know a, a catastrophic for a for a for a student but actually really easily solvable for an institution and the student you know was crying and and the the student felt like uh, this was a sign that they weren't supposed to be here and the reaction from the student was I knew I wasn't supposed to be here and so I think that's the. I think that, that that's a really, really common challenge that we're seeing now in higher education. Isn't it's not necessarily the barriers to access. It's the it's um, it's it's sort of the, um, it's what happens once a student comes on campus. Now, one of the one of the solutions there is, I think, a mindset change in higher education. It's this assumption that we have and, 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 and it goes to the design and to the structure of policies. But the assumption that we have around around learners, I think that we're seeing a movement now to recognize that every learner um is wanted and every learner comes to an institution um complete and 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 unique and specific and and we're now at a point with technology and with resources in this country to 
to be able to design systems and design you know interventions and design experiences that speak to the unique and individual needs of of, of every single learner so then it's like well, then we go down to the faculty and we're like well you know i teach hundreds of students a year maybe you know especially if i'm at a community college like like queensboro community college where a, an individual faculty member literally is teaching hundreds of students per year and you say well how can you you know how can you possibly have a, a, a relationship with each of these students that's hard i think that's really really hard and that's where you know that's where the institution comes in and provides the faculty member with professional development support and resources i think with technology it's becoming much much easier um and i think that we are seeing across the system that a little bit goes a long way so at you know at an interaction with a student where you use the student's name um you know like positive feedback uh you know unsolicited positive feedback um you know these these kinds of small interventions at the faculty student level um, have a tendency to go a long way they're way uh, there's sort of an, an innumerable, innumerable amount of stories of students um, who have uh, who have been sort of um, uh, uh, sort of per, forever changed by an interaction with the faculty member. The faculty member can't even really remember, you know. And so, and that's not that's, that's not a bad thing. I think that it just speaks to the significance of the faculty member in the in the in the process of, of development for our learners. Um, back over to you, Kim. Thank you so very much, Derek. I'm going to pose a question, and this question has kind of come up in the chat, but before I do, Penny, the data, there's a request out there for the data that you referenced, if you would share a link um, in the chat or share it with us and we'll get it back out to you. But I'd so like think, for you to- I think, Kim, we have our website um, shared already. And if you go to our website, there's a tab called Impact. You can get to the studies that way. Thank you so very much, Melody, for putting the link out there. And thank you, Penny. How would you describe the changing role of faculty regarding student engagement? Historically, you know, faculty were solely focused on and responsible for delivering content and crafting relevant assignments designed to contextualize the curriculum. Faculty are now realizing greater responsibility for student engagement and student outcomes. How can leadership better support faculty in engaging and retaining students? And this coincides with the question that we have out there. How do you incentivize faculty to take these courses and get engaged? So Lori, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I really appreciate the question. I think there was a time when information was not so ubiquitous and easily accessible. Um, the university was a place where people came because it was where the knowledge was accessible, either because of the faculty or within um, library services, but now more than ever, information and educational content is available at our hands and um, any professor has the knowledge and students are the consumer. So ultimately, I really believe that within the area of academic, uh, our, our job as an institution is not to provide the content, in my opinion, the inputs-based approach, but instead having us look at outcomes and our efforts in relation to the mission, the values of an institution and what the outcomes might be for job placement, and careers, which is very important. Um, I think institutional leadership is critical. For us, incentives are a priority. Many institutions have within a rank and promotion process clearly aligned where faculty and professional development is a priority. Um, opportunities for research, scholarly activity, um, travel, travel abroad, Partnerships with students is very important. Badging and additional credentialing, opportunity for faculty to uh, pursue degrees, um, certificates themselves, ways for us to have experiential or hands-on learning opportunities, I think are all very important. Thank you, Derek. Any thoughts? Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, I'm just thinking about my own journey as a faculty member really quick and uh, and how um, what is expected of me has changed over over those years. Um, I, I think I was I, I'm sad to say I was I, I had taught several courses before I had been introduced to the concept of a learning outcome, you know, and so I think I was I had been trained to be 
sort of like a facilitator of an experience, which is good, you know, but I thought of, you know, education as an experience. Um, and so, and it was my job as a faculty member to cultivate a certain type of experience. And that experience was rigorous and it was intense and it was, um, you know, and it was, it was mind blowing or whatever. Um, but then uh, as I, as I, you know, as I was introduced to, um, you know, to this, you know, to uh, instructional designers. And so I'm so happy that when I started my faculty career, there really wasn't um, a profession called instructional design. And now there is. And I'm so happy that there are you know thousands of instructional designers now working and helping faculty members um, sort of in, accelerate the impact of their work. Um, and 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 you know so so anyway so so I think that 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 you know technology has been a major part of of my you know of my of of the change in my experience as as a professor and we're also seeing that at this at the systems level and so there used to be a day when there were um, these things called online universities um and uh, and and that's not the case anymore every you know every university is online every university is digitally like a, a, you know and now in this post covid era literally every university is digitally powered digitally digitally um digitally sort of enabled um and i think that creates massive opportunities for us as faculty members to um to have a much deeper and richer relationship with our with our students but then also um a broader and and more more dynamic uh, relationship with our students um, and, and I saw, you know, I saw some questions in there about, you know, how do we, you know, about, about this issue of belonging how do we facilitate this sort of sense of belonging? And I think that that's, I, I, I feel like I spoke to that in, in, you know, earlier, but I feel like that's, um, in a lot of ways, the, the core to, um, you know, uh, the, I think that's, that's sort of step one, I think of the classroom experience, um, is, is acknowledging, actually that's a pre-classroom experience. It's before you even walk into the classroom, um, just adopting this mindset that every single person who is there is supposed to be there and is bringing something valuable to the learning experience for everyone for everyone else and for me as a faculty member back over to you kim thanks thank you penny um thanks so much kim um so you know the first thing i i want to address right is the is is the fact that as michael pointed out and several others you know, many faculty, not all faculty, but many faculty have little or no preparation to teach. And so um, I think it is it is our duty. They deserve to be prepared to do the job that we're asking them to do. And when we ask faculty to assist in meeting our student success goals, um, they need to have the teaching practices that our research has shown, right? Um, improve student engagement and deepen student learning. And when they have those practices, they see that happening in front of them. And I think that's very motivating, right? To, to actually see your students more engaged, asking better questions, um, completing projects, uh, you know, with a greater uh, sense of quality, et cetera. Um, but we don't want to forget, and I really appreciate that your question focuses on leadership. What does leadership need to do? And with no question, actually, because we're data obsessed, we have data on this, um, it's of crucial importance that leaders recognize, reward, and celebrate effective teaching. Now, um, we've been able to show that there are some simple ways to do that. Um, a president or provost um, noting that a faculty member has engaged in comprehensive professional development, writing a letter that recognizes and thanks them for that is important. Um, hosting an event to celebrate accomplishments of faculty in that way is important. But I don't want to leave out the more um, required processes, promotion and tenure. Um, we need to recognize quality teaching better than we have in the past. And so we need to look at those processes in specifically um, and improve those and make sure that we really are recognizing quality instruction when, when an individual has done the work, taken the time, made the effort to indeed improve um, their craft teaching. Thank you, Penny. Michael. Yeah, so at Queensboro, we are uh, currently um, in the process of re-examining our uh, requirements for tenure and promotion, and um, and we're you know we're we're at the City University of York, New York, and so, uh, so 
many of our, our faculty actually, you know, can participate in graduate research with graduate students because the, the graduate center is, is open to all faculty, whether they're at a, uh, a four year or two year institution in the university. So we do have a lot of faculty who do research um, and that's always been an important part of our, our tenure and promotion process. But now uh, we're really trying to emphasize um, a more comprehensive way to evaluate teaching and to include that as an important component of the tenure decision. Um, we've recently um, developed a new process for teaching observations. And so the observers actually have to go through a training and, uh, and are, are you know, looking for the, the kinds of you know, effective teaching practices that we're providing them with in, uh, in the faculty development workshops. And uh, so that's helped a lot. We're, we're starting to see faculty now put together actual portfolios of their, of their teaching practice and bring those to the tenure and promotion committee. Um, and also we're seeing the, the tenure and promotion committees recognize research in the classroom uh, in terms of, you know, the impact of, of specific teaching practices and, and how, it, how it affects students. And so that's also uh, something that we've been seeing lately. And so I think these, that's really an important um, consideration. If you wanna change how faculty teach campus, there needs to be, it, that needs to be recognized in the reward structure. I, you know, I, I, I expect it's a little bit easier at a community college, even though we do have this research background, um, you know, good teaching is, is really valued here. Um, if you're at an R1 university or a research, uh, research intensive university, uh, that might be a little bit tougher to do, but I, you know, I encourage you to do it anyways. I think that um, the undergraduates going to the R1 university still are looking for great teachers. And uh, it has to be part of the part of the equation. Um, so I think that's that's an important consideration. Um, we're also providing incentives for faculty to take the workshops. Um, we've you know secured grant funds to be able to do that, as well as pay for the workshops. And that that's been critical in this sort of difficult budget climate uh, to, to be able to make that happen and to keep it going over time. So that's uh, another important point is that you know, to provide large scale uh, faculty development and teaching um, is, is expensive. And so you've, you've got to be able to secure the funds and tie that, that initiative to your overall strategic plan goals and your student success goals. Um, so that's, that's also important. Great. Thank you. Kind of a follow-up question to some of the comments that you've made it in responding to the last question. It's out here about um, what advice do we have to determine when certain professional development opportunities should be required versus optional and, and the role of leadership here um, and whoever wants to chime in, if we would take that as a follow-up to the, the previous question. When is it optional? When is it required? Yeah, I mean, City University of New York is probably got one of the strongest faculty unions in the country, and uh, and and you know more power to them. They're they're, they're good to work with, but um, you know the idea of making something that's required uh, would, would be difficult. And you know ultimately, you want faculty to want to take the training, and uh, so we've really really worked on you know just talking with faculty about what what this does for you and about their, their fellow faculty members' experiences in the course. And um, AQ does a nice job actually of surveying faculty and getting their opinions on their, on their products. And uh, uh, one thing we found is it's been, uh, our faculty love the, the workshops. And then they say, well, they're a lot of work. And, but they also say, well, I, earned, I learned an awful lot and I would recommend it to my colleagues, which I think you know, well above the 90% rate of, of you know, participant rates. So um, that's been, it's been an easier sell than I thought it would be, honestly. And we have faculty, you know, approaching, you know, the president and provost and saying, thank you for providing this opportunity for us, right? Which is, you know, more than you could ever hope for. 
uh, in terms of a faculty response. So, um, you know, I think really, really focusing on, you know, um, the, the benefits to individual faculty and, and just helping them help their students do better. You know, no one likes to give poor grades to their students. They want their students to succeed. So um, it's, it's been an easier sell than I thought it would be when I started this, this whole thing. Excellent. Any other responses to that question? Just yeah, I might just add that um, I think a whole webinar series on requiring versus encouraging, but I also think trying to be creative that if there is professional development that we believe as an institution is vital for faculty and staff, because I know some of you have really brought up what about staff development and training and the importance of staff members on our campuses and student success why not embed the professional development within a faculty meeting? The coaching staff at our institution is a great example. This week we had a professional development opportunity that um, involved Gen Z student recruitment, retention, and we went to a coaches meeting and embedded the PD within that forum and within that meeting setting, um, division college meeting. So there could be ways that there is a time that's already set out for our folks to be available um, and having the PD embedded within that time frame. It may not be an hour and maybe you take 20 or 30 minutes um, and then you have continued development throughout the semester that folks can come back to. But I do think thinking creatively about that is important. Thank you, Lori and Michael. So as we're thinking about it, and I want to take pause right here because I did see one other question in the in the Q and A. ACUE stands for the Association of College and University Educators. It's an association. ACAO is the Association of Chief Academic Officers, and ACE, of course, is the American Council on Education. Continuing our conversation, tell us it through your lens. Um, what does success look like? How does culture change? Penny. Thanks, Kim. Um, so what does success look like? Um, from, and, and I think folks um, have, have kind of described it a bit, but more engaged students, achieving at higher levels and graduating more prepared for the future. You know, one of the things that I like to point out is that when we improve teaching, and, and I just want to add a little bit um, to the, is it required or is it um, something folks volunteer for? And I think it's very challenging to require um, professional development if we're not rewarding it, if we're not recognizing it. So I really think those two things come together. But at the end of the day, our college professors, our instructors deserve to be prepared for the work we're asking them to do. And so, you know, that's quite important, but what does it look like, right? Well, it looks like I, I said more engaged students, but don't forget, right? Energize faculty, faculty who feel more comfortable. They've reported to us talking with their peers about instruction and less kind of isolated if, in, in regards to their teaching and learning. Um, and this includes adjunct faculty, and that's important because oftentimes adjunct faculty will report feeling isolated and not connected to the community, but when they engage in some professional development with other faculty, I think that really connects them to the community. And I love what Lori just said about um, during meetings, right? Having a 20 minute, a 30 minute. Um, but something I want us to remember is for me, that 20, 30 minutes is to add on to a foundation that you have, right? And so I wanna make sure that all of our instructors have a foundation in effective instruction that they can add to at a conference, at a meeting. Um, but let's make sure they get that firm foundation early on and they're not figuring it out as they're teaching students, but rather they, they're coming in with that, that nice foundation. Thank you, excellent point. Lori, what does success look like? And how yeah, does culture so, change? Yeah. Thank you, really appreciate this. Um, I really believe that success is a team effort where everyone on campus plays a vital role. And that's from somebody who's the custodial staff, swipes a card in the cafeteria, welcomes our students, 
um, janitorial staff that interacts with our students every single day, faculty, leaders on campus, uh, executive staff, up to the president of an institution. So I do think that each and every one is so very important. Questions have come up along the way, a sense of belonging. That's true for our students, but I also think that's true for our employees at the institution. When you feel a sense of belonging, connection to leadership, the mission, um, it's an authentic self that comes and interacts with our students, and our students can sense that. So I think I'd just like to bring up how important it is that faculty are involved, faculty are connected to students every single day, but we also have a whole group of staff members on our campuses uh, who are as well. I think meaningful change does not take place overnight. Um, and, and from my perspective, both as an ACAO board member, but a provost at a university, trust is important. I think trust allows us to invest our time, our talents, our treasure into efforts that an institutional culture needs. It depends on leadership being ethical and authentic, and this is critical to building trust so I do think it's up to us as leaders to demonstrate, to have time for that relationship building. And if we're gonna expect change at an institution from faculty whom we serve, I serve faculty at the institution, I'm the provost, but I also think it's a very important for us to think back and to flip that pyramid that without our students and faculty members and establishing that relationship, change cannot take place. Um, and, and that's important. We sometimes let the tactical parts of our job and within the strategic plan that are critical, so don't get me wrong, those are critical, get in the way. But I do think if we don't allow for that time to build relationships, I think that will make it very challenging and will continue to put pressure on the employee base, including faculty and staff, when we're going to hit that brick wall because of that breakdown in partnerships. And then success, I think, I mean, Penny, you you mentioned it, retention, graduation rates. For me, job placement, the skill set that a graduate leaves an institution with, written oral communication, interaction, the ability to present to an audience, staying engaged as alumni, I think that tells me the experience as an undergraduate student or graduate student on an institutional level. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Lori, for elevating the discussion on trust and relationship building. Michael, your thoughts. Well, in, you know, in the realm of, you know, faculty development, success is, I think, um, faculty understanding that what they do in the classroom can have a, a, a dramatic effect on how well their students actually do. And that sounds very simple, but many faculty believe that really all of the effort has to come from the students. And, um, you know, research study after research study has shown that when you employ constructivist teaching techniques in the classroom, uh, students are far more engaged and learn far more and retain that material much longer. And um, when faculty realize that, and that they have that, that sort of shift in thinking then they're they're off, you know. They're they're off figuring out exactly what that means to them and how they're going to do it in their their classrooms, what their their personalities and their approach to the topic and their subject area, what what that means for them. It's still very very individualized in terms of you know exactly what they do and how the the, the students experience their class. But uh, it's really that that shift in mindset that I I look for when I, I work with faculty on these things. And, uh, you know, the much smaller study I did at Broward that was funded, funded by the NSF, we really spent a lot of time talking with faculty about their thoughts and attitudes. And uh, we really did see those shifts, those kinds of shifts occur. And so that's, you know, that's what I'm looking for. Um, I think, though, you know, it has to, you can't just do one thing uh, in a vacuum and expect, you know, student success and retention to increase dramatically. You have to come at it from all, all different directions, of course you know, uh, changes in student academic support um, and, you know, everything from financial aid to counseling and, and all of that has, has to work well uh, before students will be retained. Um, one interesting thing that AQ has done recently is they've launched something called Fostering a Culture of Belonging, which is a, a new type of AQ workshop around 
around diversity and belonging and inclusiveness, um, but it's, it's intended not just for faculty, but also for staff. So in a few weeks, we're gonna, we're gonna launch uh, that course here at Queensboro for our student facing staff. So we have a bunch of advisors, financial aid counselors, uh, a member of our counseling faculty is gonna do it and uh, librarians and uh, just people who work with students on a daily basis outside the classroom. And so we're really excited to see what kind of outcomes we have from that and, and how those, those staff members approach this and what they think they got out of it. Um, so that, that's exciting. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing how that goes this spring. Thank you, Michael, for the reminder that change does not occur overnight. Thank you so much. Derek. Thank you so much. Um, so, you know, I'm just thinking about all the perspectives on this, you know, on this panel here. You know, we have the perspective of the chief academic officers. We have this perspective of the, you know, the university educators. We have perspective of community colleges, and and then from ACE, you know, the the you know the broadest umbrella of organizations uh, in higher education, representing two year, four year, uh, you know, uh, and public and private. Um, and I think that the what does success look like starts with you know what's the reality that we're all facing. And so here's some of the realities that we're all facing. Number one is that students are more um, different than they have ever been, and that's good. We recognize that's good. Um, two is uh, the way that people learn is more different than it has ever been, and we recognize that that's um, that that's an opportunity. Um, the role of the faculty member is you know more different than I think it has ever been. Uh, there's there's some states where there's a lot of political pressure for a faculty member, you know, like the, the, the idea that the faculty member is the guardian of the curriculum is not a um, it's not a given anymore. That's a contested. That's a contested um, assumption, I think. Uh, and so um, and what we're asking uh, institutions to do is, you know, is more dynamic than, than I think it has ever been. I think that community colleges are like, um, you know, like somewhere between two and 5% of their, uh, of their uh, towards uh, or, or in their evolutionary journey, right? Like, like we were just beginning to understand what community colleges can do. Um, and so um, these are sort of the realities. And then I go back to, you know, Penny's observation that like, you know, success, success is greater engagement. And so everyone here is, um, you know, is everyone at the, at the university, uh, you know, feels like they're supposed to be here and they feel like, um, like they're getting closer and closer and closer towards the version of themselves that they want for themselves, that they're defining for themselves, you know, and then, and then I think about the, you know, all of our chief academic officers and sort of the challenging, the really challenging roles that they play on universities, sort of representing the interests of the learners and the faculty and the staff and the institution and the stakeholders and the ecosystems in which they, which they operate, you know, University of Pikeville is not just the University of Pikeville, like it's, it is an important part of the community in which in which it is situated, and and so the role of the academic, uh, the chief academic officer there is not just this university role; it's a community role. And so, um, you know, so success. I think uh, success in that context is, you know, is uh, it, it's it's like a miracle. I think that it, that it, you know that that it happens, um, but it. But um, but I think the fact that it does happen speaks to the significance of these institutions that we all, um, I think, are honored to be a part of. And so, yeah, so back over to you, Kim. Thank you, Derek. We have just a few more minutes, and this has been a rich conversation. Um, now, where to from here? As executives in higher education associations and executives on college campuses, what is our role in helping or facilitating faculty development designed to improve student outcomes. And as you're responding, um, Penny, if you would share when fostering a culture of belonging webinar will be offered again. So where to from here? So thank you um, for reminding me about the fostering a culture of belonging and that you, you, you can't, you can't beat having a partner introduce your newest offering. So thank you, M Michael. But um, we did see or do see, right, the need for all staff. Um, we understand that every interaction that a student has with everyone on our campus or in an online course um, tells them they belong or they don't, right? And so we've made sure that that course will be available to, as Michael said, um, security, personnel, leaders, advisors, librarians, et cetera. Um, and we're really excited about that. 
at the same time, um, I think a student's sense of I belong in college oftentimes comes a lot from their experience in the classroom or online course. And you know what this entire conversation reminds me of is a recent article in the Chronicle um, titled The Damaging Myth of the Natural Teacher. And in their words, that hurts faculty and students alike. That myth hurts faculty because it's, it's this idea that you, you either are brilliant, charismatic, and empathetic, and, and therefore a natural teacher, or you're not. And that's simply not true. You know, whether or not we're a like boisterous extrovert or a quiet introvert, we can learn how to teach effectively and in line with our personality. You know, we've talked a lot about how the myth hurts students, right? Um, I think, you know, one of the things I've said a lot is student engagement, but let's not forget student learning. It deepens student learning. So to Lori's point, students are better prepared for the future when they've learned good communication skills, good critical thinking, good teamwork skills, and all of those things are in our curriculum and are things that our instructors attempt to teach and can teach even better when they've got the evidence-based teaching skills and strategies um, that, that they know those skills and strategies and they put them in place and, and use them effectively. So um, my, my last thought here is let's bust that myth and prepare our faculty to teach and graduate more students prepared for their future. Thank you, Lori. Yeah, I appreciate this. I, I think I'm gonna take the perspective of our student base, which is uh, mostly first-generation students. We have a 90% Pell eligibility. Our students come from rural and remote locations. And as I've read many of our student evaluations over Christmas break, and it was interesting reading our doctoral programs, our medical optometry evaluations, and those students and their needs and our undergraduate students. And I found a lot of similarities. Um, and, and Penny, you talked a lot about what it means to be a student and whether you're paying the tuition of a medical student or whether you're a student who needs additional support and you're an undergraduate student at the institution and have zero higher education experience, and your parents may have challenges even trying to figure out the right questions to ask. And so for us, parents and families are important. Um, having some sort of office connected to families is important. We find that even with our graduate programs and doctoral programs, that sense of belonging extends past our students onto family members and making sure that there's an inclusive environment for them and ways that we can access communication is very important. But our students are looking for a home and they're looking for deep connections. Um, some students may be looking for shelter. There are food and security challenges within students as well and our student populations across all of our universities. And so meeting the basic needs of students obviously is vital, but beyond that, a connection across campus and we often talk about within our community some sort of connection. Is it a faculty member, a coach, a staff member within student success or in the admissions office who initially recruited them? Having some type of connection on our campuses is, is, is vital. Thank you so very much for sharing. Michael, on to you and then Derek. I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll end by, by saying that being a community college faculty member, especially at a place like CUNY or Queensboro, where we have students whose home countries are number well above 100. We have more than 75 native languages spoken in their homes. It's an incredibly diverse place. And to teach that, that wide range of, of students um, anything, you know, you really have to be very well equipped in terms of in knowing how to teach. And um, so they deserve all the faculty development we can give them. And so um, that's always been in my approach and my attitude towards, you know, trying to trying to push faculty development. It's, it's a difficult thing uh, to make happen, but um, boy, it's just critical to the success of our college. Thank you, Michael. Derek, for our final comments. 
Thank you. I, I know we're about out of time, so I'll just be quick. I think the as you know, as leaders, our assignment is to uh, is to ask for help. And so we have so so many excellent resources here that are available to us. I think it's efficient. I think it's uh, I think it's smart. I think it's it's good that we that we don't try to do everything ourselves. That we reach out to some experts. You have some excellent experts here on this call. We and 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 and, and reach out to them and and uh, and have them be your allies in in advancing um, and achieving the outcomes uh, that you and your faculty and your staff uh, want to see. Um, so uh, you know, there's there's you know, there, there's so much, I think, available here. Thank you so very much to each of our panelists. It's been a wonderful discussion this afternoon. The recording will be available on ACE's website as well as ACAO at a subsequent time, probably early next week. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon and a um, good weekend and hope to see you soon. The ACE annual meeting is scheduled for April the 13th through the 15th here in Washington, DC. Hope to see you there. Thank you. <laughs>